All right. Hello, and, and welcome to this book discussion. Uh, Zoravar Dolating is the author of several books before this, but uh, this is his latest book. It's called Power Shift, India-China Relations in a Multipolar World. Um, thanks for joining us for this discussion, uh, Zoravar. And uh, I have to, uh, I, I have to, I'm not sure if I should give you credit for bravery or foolhardiness, um, because you brought out a book, you actually have a book out on the India-China-Ladakh standoff and all that's gone into it, right in the middle of the standoff. So while this was a pleasure to read, uh, I almost wondered if you had your heart in your mouth with the idea that this was also a massive risk, that some kind of a dramatic turn of events, uh, either a full-fledged conflict or a detente or uh, the Chinese pulling back from, uh, from, uh, from territory, one of those could have happened in between the time your book was done and coming out uh, on the stands, uh, did you feel nervous and you feel a little vindicated right now that you you were able to predict that this would have no quick answers? Thank you, thank you, Swasi. Thanks so much for supporting this conversation. Yeah, that's that's such a great question. In fact, uh, uh, my conversation with the editorial director at the time, Prasoon Chatterjee. He's the one who encouraged me, by the way, on this project a few years ago. It got held up just when COVID sort of breaks out. And then this Ladakh crisis sort of breaks out in, in the summer. And uh, the publisher, Macmillan, sort of encouraged me to sort of just crank it out there, get it sooner. And you're absolutely right. I think I'm, one of the biggest dilemmas was that this is a tipping point. I don't know if it's a turning point, but certainly it was a tipping point in just the nature of the India-China relationship of this period of engagement that's been lasting for three decades. And there were a multitude, cacophony of voices that were sort of pulling in different directions, making sort of fairly sort of uh, strong statements that this is going to be a new normal. Uh, we've seen a bit of that, but I think we've also seen that there are structural trends that are manifested in this crisis. So this was not a, a shot from blue that we're being told. I think there was a buildup of tension, acrimony, uh, even even competition on frontiers over the past decade. And I think we've seen a series of crises. You've reported on them for so many years. And uh, this one is, of course, the most dramatic. So I think when I, when I step back, I said, maybe this is a great time for readers who are asking big questions on what are the origins of this dispute. I mean, today's uh, generation born after the end of the Cold War have no recollection of a period of tension and competition in the India-China relationship. They've seen engagement and this sort of, okay, it's tentative engagement, but it's been more or less stable peace and tranquility. So now they are beginning to sort of wonder were there other phases in the past that also had uh, a, a sense of, and are we replaying those moments in history? What can we learn from the past? So that was one facet of it. And the other was that this idea of a past shift or maybe past shifts where we are seeing so many uh, changes as the unipolar world has just cracked open in the last decade. And you've seen so many rising powers, India, one of them, but of course, China, the most dramatic, you've got Russia, you've got Indonesia, you've got so many other regional powers, Iran, and they're all now pulling and trying to assert their identities and their regional sort of spheres of influence. So, so I think the India-China relationship also has to be seen in that transformation or the sudden breakdown of what we felt, or at least the Indian foreign policy had bet on American preponderance for 50 years. I mean, if you look back at those debates in the early 2000s. So I think there, there were so many wheels within wheels. And I think Ladakh is sort of a culmination of so many uh, crossroads and tipping points. So uh, yeah, I, I'm glad I got it out there. Yeah, and it is, it is actually remarkable that you're able to look at the policy, even the policy within the uh, uh, within the Ladakh standoff uh, without getting dated in a sense or uh, you know blindsided by events if you like um one of the things you say about policy in your book and it's a, it's a very strong statement so it stands out is that schizophrenia and paranoia cannot be substitutes for smart and sober statecraft which must include dealing directly with china um, unpack that a little bit for me. What is the kind of schizophrenia and paranoia you think that has really bedeviled India's ability to manage, if you like, the China challenge? Mm -hmm. So that's uh, so. Let me let's start with 
the uh, the inception or the uh, the origins of Modi's China policy, or when he comes into when this government comes in in 2014, and I think I think let's be uh, maybe a little generous to the Indian policymaker at the time. They inherited a world that was way different from the previous decade. You're seeing a China which is now beginning to claim a bigger role for itself in Asia, in South Asia. You see a lot of those major regional policy changes for, of the Xi Jinping regime coming out in 2013, 2014, the Belt and Road, a strong Pakistan policy, a strong policy to reshape Asia. So, so you are confronting- A blue water navy. Even yeah. a, a yeah. blue water navy, you know, the strategy. Absolutely, absolutely. So, so uh, and, and by the way, none of this was uh, mostly intended for India. I mean, we try to sort of think that India has sort of been the a key part of China's policy calculus. We haven't really been. We've been one part of a larger periphery that they're trying to re-establish what I suppose most great powers in the past have tried to do. So, so we, the, the Modi government, the Indian policymakers confronted this new China. I think that what I'm trying to suggest is that uh, I, I, maybe hindsight is always a, a, a bit more easier on, on, let's say, an analyst, but uh, that uh, did we make the right calls in adjusting to this world order that's coming into being because yes there's going to be a lot more competition uh, with china who is now encroaching on your regional periphery and your aspirations of preponderance that we have sort of have our own manifest destiny but i think there was also uh, we uh, keeping an eye on world order we after a while have always been claiming we want a multipolar world a multi civilization world a, a world that is beyond uh, dominated by Western uh, centric institutions. So I think there was also an opportunity in this. Uh, I, I see Indian policymakers pulling in these different directions, trying to juggle these balls. And what they uh, have, uh, have not been really able to do is the power gap with China has sort of expanded, in fact, in the, in the last 10 years. So you're actually dealing with, a, uh, with, uh, with a quite a bit of asymmetry. And it's, it's a tricky policy problem, in a sense. So so, so, so I, I go away from that binary of just pure diplomacy or outright confrontation. I'm trying to sort of straddle that space, that middle space of, let's say, a real politic engagement where you also have strong, robust ties with the major powers. So I think uh, the, what I try to bring out in the book is that even in the past, the, the most productive or stable uh, phases of engagement or stability in India-China relations was when you had these two pillars working together. You had very strong engagement with the Chinese leadership. And you also had uh, fairly productive ties with China's neighbors and of course the superpowers during the Cold War and the major powers today. So I think we sometimes leave one side off and then things start getting unsettled. You know, we, we try to focus more on the major powers and lose the engagement side off or vice versa. And that's where you get, tend to lose out because you have to be after all realistic that You've got a five to one asymmetry today. I mean, if you're talking of from every metric of material power, the Chinese have outpaced India. So that's a reality that you have to now deal with. Now you say that, okay, I'm going to spend the next 20, 30 years narrowing that gap. But that gap, that's why I said schizophrenia and uh, uh, making a lot of noise is going to not narrow that gap. You're going to have to make domestic transformations in your institutions, in your polity, in your, in your, in your, in your industrial policies, in your scientific technological base and all that requires not only the major powers but maybe a bit of engagement with the Chinese as well after all they leverage the United States and the Soviets uh, quite selfishly to build themselves up why can't we play that game I've, I've never I've never really sort of bought into this idea that you've got to make a hard swing one side so that's my overarching theme but you don't risk uh, being called a pacifist uh, even a, 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 a panda hugger, as the term goes in this book, um, it, it, it's in a sense, uh, you've written, I think, three or four books before this on the India-China dispute. So I'm, I'm not putting any labels because uh, you have really engaged with the history of the two countries. Uh, but in this book, right in the middle of a standoff between India and China, you're essentially saying, uh, actually, there is a middle path. Actually, we do need to see what are the reasons behind uh, this particular action or that particular action, are you being um, over sort of uh, too much of a peacenik? So, so Hasini, uh, it's funny you say that because uh, I'm reading today Indian policy and I actually see diplomacy is still the preferred option by Delhi today, New Delhi today. I mean, I think they're realistic enough 
the folks in South Block, the major strategists, even military commanders, that you are dealing with a, a major power on your frontiers. Uh, I'm not saying that we are not going to defend territory, but when you're dealing with disputed territory and you're dealing with a nuclear environment with fairly sophisticated conventional firepower, which both sides can mobilize, you have to play a very, very different game. I mean, after all, look back at the US-Soviet uh, uh, sort of competition in Europe and elsewhere. I mean, they, they got through most of uh, their major phase of confrontation without a direct clash. I mean, there were a lot of proxy conflicts which are violent and created upheaval for the rest of the world, but they did not get into a direct confrontation. So I think uh, we, we, we also have to be realistic now. If you have a major power uh, identity that you want to build up to, you can't afford to uh, get into a conflict uh, if you can avoid it. So now having said that, of course, there, there are portions on the frontier. I mean, this is now maybe an operational question, which let's leave to the professionals, but maybe there are parts of the territory where you simply need for your future security. And I think there you draw your red lines. But I think the resolution of this standoff, like the resolution of the entire India-China territorial dispute of 70 years, cannot but be a political settlement, a geopolitical settlement. So now, will we get there in the next five years, 10 years, 20 years? Uh, my reading of the situation and history is that uh, we've had episodes where they came close to settling. And those episodes, funnily or ironically, were never really because India and China sort of said that this is the time is right to do this. It is because the international environment uh, moved in such a direction, maybe in 1960 when the Chinese were sort of completely isolated and were confronting both the Soviets and the Americans. And they said, okay, let's try and cut a deal with the Indians. We didn't take it up, but that was one context. 79, 80, again, Deng Xiaoping comes in, is developing China, modernizing it, wants to open up to the world, wants a peaceful periphery. Uh, by the way, Americans are encouraging the Chinese at the time to stabilize ties with India because of the, 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 the confrontation or the competition with the Soviets. So there's always been bigger geopolitical factors that persuade the Chinese uh, to sort of play the India policy in a different direction. So it could lead to cooperation or cooperation. And I think we also now tend to also let third parties shape our policy, right? I mean, so both sides have never really been bilateral in a sense. And I think uh, the foreign minister alluded to this recently, where uh, this has always been a, a multilateral geopolitical context that is there. And if we could make it bilateral, that is, look at each other more seriously for our own sake, that's when that turning point will come where you will tend to treat each other as major neighbors and might just have a framework of coexistence. It may be competitive coexistence, but it has to be a framework where you're living in a common neighborhood. So, in other words, it is as you, you know, your, your book actually has uh, uh, India and China as two balls on a very, very tricky balance and, and that balance has to be maintained. If we could talk a little bit about, um, in, in your book, uh, you've written about not just 2020, of course, you've written about what leads up to it. Um, and the, the popular perception has always been, okay, India and China actually did not have a war between them for 2000 years. In 1962, they had a conflict. It didn't go well for India. And this is something uh, that India has lived with. They, uh, you know, the idea that we will never again uh, be taken off balance or uh, uh, you know, bested in a war the way we were in the 1962 war. So every time there is a conflict, there's always that at the back of one's mind. But you also point out that there is a slightly longer uh, trend line, if you like, from 2013, where we see uh, the situation at the line of actual control, uh, just, you know, the, 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 the assumptions between the two sides seem to uh, becoming more of a mismatch. Um, and we can talk about each of those events from 2013 to 2020. Uh, but give me a sense of whether you think that actually what happened is that the India-China compact of 1993 which was then upgraded with a bunch of, uh, with a series of agreements, is now redundant. That India and China absolutely have to find a new agreement between them, a new mechanism between them, in order to go forward. Yeah, absolutely. So, so let's go back to the the, the last modus vivendi, which was established in 1988. Uh, it, it, I, what I try and bring out in the book was that uh, the basis of this understanding was actually quite modest. They didn't actually solve their problems. 
the only thing the the Indian and Chinese leaders sort of said is that we we have recognized we have a territorial dispute. We're going to solve it now politically and diplomatically. Uh, while we're doing that, we're going to try and maintain peace and tranquility on the frontiers. And the third pillar of this uh, understanding was we're going to develop ties in other areas, which could be at that time they nobody invested globalization to take off the way it did, but uh, culture, people to people, economy. So these were the three pillars that we're going to deal with the dispute politically, peace on the frontier, and develop ties. So that's when you have these agreements in the 1990s that uh, start giving concrete sort of norms on how to deal uh, uh, with situations where forces will come closer. So you have a series of confidence building sort of agreements uh, right up to the last five, six years. So, so I think what, what breaks down is, uh, it's essentially a breakdown at the geopolitical sense. I think the space that uh, China perceives to seek for itself in Asia and what India seeks for itself is now coming to some sort of a, a loggerheads. And, and that is sort of manifesting on the frontier because uh, once you have uh, uh, given up on some sort of an accommodation, then you're going to start seeking security for yourself. So it's a classic security dilemma. So last 10 years, you've got uh, Indian policymakers now who have instructed the army to move closer and closer to the disputed areas, build up the military forces. And the Chinese, of course, started much earlier. So so it's it's been that. Uh, and, and the confidence building agreements that you referred to, which have broken down, they never envisage such a large volume of forces ever being so close to each other. So we, uh, uh, if you look at uh, during the Ladakh crisis in the last three, four months, you've actually seen, I think, uh, it was the foreign minister and Wang Yi, the Chinese foreign minister, actually spoke about in their five point where eventually they will need to establish new CPMs and new frameworks to deal with this. But I think the bigger problem really is one of a, a power, shift, power shift that's happened in Asia and South Asia. And uh, 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 I, it, there is no short term sort of settlement that can alleviate that because the short term the, uh, settlement that the Chinese would prefer is India to just completely uh, sort of accept uh, this rising China the way it is. Uh, is, is simply not going to be acceptable to the Indian side. And I think what India wants China to do is accept it as a peer. I think that also, from the Chinese point of view, makes no sense to them because they're five times bigger than you. So how do you overcome this, uh, this sort of uh, this, this fractured consensus? Is you, you're going to have to sort of chug your way along by precisely the two pillars. You're going to have to build up your power externally by developing relationships from all the major players out there who all have... By the way, different China challenges. Uh, uh, you have Japan, you have Russia, you have the United States, you have Europe, you have Southeast Asia. They may not agree with you on every facet of the China's rise, but they're parts where you can sort of rely on them to build yourself up. But at the same time, uh, just that counter China policy never really works because for every counter China policy, the Chinese have their counter encirclement policy, which they've been doing for the last 70 years. So every time you build up uh, with this, they invest in Pakistan, they spread out deeper into your neighborhood. And by the way, they've not even begun the process of really uh, engaging in a hard competition with India. You know, it's still not gone there. We keep talking about it, but it's, it, that, that could happen in five, 10 years. So, so I think realism itself demands that if you can buy a period of controlled competition for 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, till your own rise is at a level where it can't be stalled through external actions, I think that's that's a smart strategy. I mean, that's what all major powers have done. The United States did it in the 19th century. It stayed aloof from major conflicts in Europe. Uh, the Chinese did it likewise for 30, 40 years until 2012, 13, till they built themselves up to a level where they could push back. Why are we trying to reinvent the wheel here? So uh, you, you, we're going to have to look at some major important lessons of history to try and sort of strike that balance. All right. Uh, and I do want to come to those lessons of history, but I, I want to briefly ask you, you know, uh, we're looking at the line of control with Pakistan and the line of actual control with China. The line of control with Pakistan sees, near, sees despite a ceasefire being announced 17 years ago, sees nearly a daily sort of skirmish, some kind of trouble on it. Uh, the line of actual control between India and China did not actually see any bloodshed for 45 years. Uh, there's been no such violence of the kind that we saw this year in Kalwan. And yet the, the, the big 
kind of dis, uh, difference between the two is that the line of control is more or less known. Um, both sides uh, know where their bunkers are. Both sides know between India and Pakistan uh, where that line is. It's, uh, it's electrified. It's, uh, it's certainly fenced. Uh, in, in many ways, it's got uh, uh, lights on it. There are all these memes around about how you can see the line of control between India and Pakistan from the moon. I'm not sure that's true. Um, and then you have the line of actual control, where it just everything seems fuzzy. Uh, officials will say, you know, that the perception, their perception of the line of actual control, our perception of the line of actual control. Uh, there are two LACs, in fact. Uh, and uh, even uh, when we say we have taken heights or that the, uh, the Chinese are standing on certain heights, we're not quite sure which side of, of whose line every, everyone is. Obviously, there is a certain um, understanding in India of where our line is, and obviously the Chinese have the same. But my question really, and this is a layman's question, why is it so hard to clarify this into one line of actual control? That's a, that's a great question. So, so uh, the the LSE was a concept that emerged in the late fifties uh, uh, when both sides, uh, India and China, uh, gave expression that now there is a major international territorial dispute on their frontiers. So they couldn't agree on that line. Though, by the way, the the line in the eastern sector of the India China border, which is uh, uh, the sec uh, the the area that lies from Sikkim all the way to Arunachal Pradesh, more or less has a defined line. So there you do not have that level of ambiguity. The LSC was really uh, referred to uh, the, the frontier between Jammu and Kashmir and Ladakh uh, and, and, um, and, and, and Xinjiang and Tibet. So it was, it was meant to be, uh, since there was no final agreed line, because you have a major, major dispute over Xi Jinping, where should that sort of so uh, I, I think the question is, why are the Chinese not willing to? Because I think from the Indian side, we've been quite keen to clarify this. So there, there are a couple of arguments there. One is the Chinese side, uh, and they've set this out there to policymakers, is that uh, defining the line would uh, dissuade India from future negotiations and reaching a settlement. So it might just be satisfied by in this interim halfway measure and sort of just not go for a final settlement. But even another argument out there, which is quite compelling, is that uh, keeping ambiguity, uh, being the stronger player, it gives you a uh, maneuver to sort of every time uh, open up a new dispute or open up uh, pressure points in areas uh, where, when you want to sort of express yourself in, in a certain way. So Ladakh is clearly, this crisis is in a sense, not just about territory. It's also possibly the Chinese sending yet another message on that side. So, so they don't want to give India the benefit of a stable frontier until the broader geopolitical understanding of Amoris Vivendi is in place. India wants to reverse it, naturally. Get the border dispute settled and then have freedom to do what you want. So if you put yourself on the Chinese side, uh, why would you let India off the hook until you have settled ties with them? But from India's perspective, of course, you want to settle the frontier and then be free to do what you want then, in your future world order. So, so there's a clash of broader strategies and the only way again to arrive at a middle ground was to have a peace and tranquility CBMs where both sides have a vested interest in not entering into an armed conflict in a major war. So I think there the Chinese also don't want to get into a major conflict. So why we, which is why we are left with these standoffs, but this one was particularly violent for those few instances. So it tells you that even leaving the dispute unsettled in this phase is, is perhaps not a uh, situation that uh, you can keep on sort of uh, bequeathing to the next generation. So, so maybe the Chinese side also will have to reconsider that as India's military power keeps on encroaching closer and closer to the frontier. It may not happen today, but in 10 years, maybe India will be at a level where it could impose significant costs on the Chinese. And at that point, the hope is that that new balance of power might just persuade both sides to come to the table and settle that. So, I, I, from today's perspective, from what you see, I don't think the Chinese are truly take you as seriously at that military strategic level to the extent that you would want to be there. So again, it's a question of narrowing that gap, building up those areas, but also doing it in a fashion where you don't get into a conflict in that process of rising. So it's, 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 it's a question of balancing those, those two aspects. In a, in a sense, 
this chronology, if you like, uh, is at the heart of a lot of the, you know, the gap in understanding between India and China, which should come first. Um, and uh, it's interesting because in September 2014, when Xi Jinping visited India, the first uh, official meeting between Prime Minister Narendra Modi, who had just been elected, and the Chinese president uh, was held, uh, we actually heard Prime Minister Modi say at a press conference that we must work towards clarifying the boundary. Uh, what is the need for these special representative talks if they're not even able to clarify the boundary? Clearly, as you said, this is not something China sees as it's in its uh, list of priorities. In fact, since September 2014, Mr. Modi and Mr. Xi met 18 times. Two of those meetings uh, were, uh, were just one-on-one -on -one, uh, you know, retreat meetings in Wuhan, Mamalapuram. They spent eight hours at a time just talking to each other. And yet we see in this entire standoff since April, uh, they have not exchanged a, a single word. Um, now, obviously, only the two gentlemen can answer why they, uh, why they haven't been able to resolve this one directly. But I want to ask a larger question. Did India actually fail to read China's mind in these few years? And is that why the standoff, um, and, and we will come to the previous standoffs as well, have been mm -hmm. increasing, if you like, in their seriousness and deadliness? Have they have they failed to misread China? I think uh, I think the Indian side took a call uh, from 2015 that uh, that they are going to have to narrow the power gap with China for it to be taken seriously. So it was a balance of power strategy that they adopted. You look at the Obama coming to the Republic Day uh, in 2015. I mean that was quite a significant development. That joint maritime document uh, for the Indo-Pacific that was laid out. So. So I think it was quite clear that even when, uh, after the first few months of the Modi government, I think the call was taken was that we're going to have to build up some element of uh, of a coalition to to deal with China. So, and and the Chinese sort of reciprocated by their counter sort of balancing. So you ended up with this tit for tat kind of game that's keep kept on playing out. And uh, Doklam was when it sort of was the first sort of uh, explosion that came out again, a manifestation of this competition. I think both sides took a, a reasonable uh, conclusion from that, that maybe this competition can be sort of alleviated through high level diplomacy, which is where we, then you got to those points of like you referred to the major uh, informal summits, leadership summits, which were really attempts at confidence building at the highest level. But I don't know if anything of substance was really engaged and because ultimately it's about making mutual sort of uh, accommodations and mutual concessions. So there was nothing really of give and take that was being able to be put across. Even though when you look back now at the, the joint statements or at least the Indian comments after, let's say, the Wuhan summit, for example, you have some important uh, reaffirmations of the old 1988 borders of Wendy. You talk of a peace and tranquility in the frontier, military guidance, uh, political guidance to the military leaderships on both sides to... Uh, responsibly sort of patrol the frontiers. You talked of simultaneous rising powers, uh, interested in stabilizing world order. So it said all the right things. They tried to make space for both these powers that are rising. Uh, again, uh, my, my own reading would be that it's just that the power gap uh, from uh, the Chinese side is not seen to be uh, narrow enough for them to make those concessions. So and the Indian side believes that uh, it can uh, accelerate some sort of an adjustment from the Chinese. So that's where you're seeing this sort of pushback in competition. And, uh, you know, who knows, like maybe uh, if you continue down a particular course and if you're able to sort of get some friends and allies on board, maybe there are parts of China's regional policy that you may be able to reset. So it's, 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 that's where our strategists at South Blocks are going to have to weigh on these questions that what are you eventually wanting Chinese policy to change in very, very specific points, you know, because I think the big picture, they come out with their rhetoric that we've accepted you as a rising power, you're a major power, you can say all those things. But on the ground, where specifically do you want those changes and in what time frames? And I think I, that's, that's really the challenge here. So India has to take that call because now we've taken a call that we are kind of stepping away from this broader Asian economic integration that's happening. You've again discussed this and there's a big debate out there on 
uh, leaving China to reshape economic arrangements in Asia. That's one. Uh, even on uh, connectivity and parts not related to Pakistan but other area, maybe like I make the case that there could be possibilities where you could sort of find some three-way arrangements in the future, maybe on uh, parts with, with ASEAN, on northeast uh, parts of India, etc., where you could sort of tap or at least convert China's economic footprint to make it advantageous for you and your neighbors. So the alternative is they're going to do it anyway. Is there a way for you to shape that engagement by accepting the new reality of China as a player in South Asia? So I think that's where uh, that part uh, really, really comes in. So, so I think uh, you've got uh, in Indian policy dealing with uh, asymmetry. It's trying its best on the capacity front, but we, of course, uh, uh, I think uh, most recent data again shows that our level of uh, delivery, even on our immediate neighbors, while not insignificant, is nowhere uh, on 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 at a level where you can tell those neighbors to do what you want them to do. You know, so they have options out there. They're playing the role of what India did during the Cold War, exploiting all the different actors out there. And why not, right? We do the same. In fact, we are doing the same. We are also in, at a global level trying to draw benefits from everyone. So, so it's, it's, it, it really comes down to uh, where do you see yourself uh, and what kind of uh, role can you reinvent yourself in South Asia where you retain leadership? Because geopolitical leadership you do have. I don't think the Chinese can ever really compete with you if you start getting into games in the neighborhood beyond Pakistan. But when it comes down to development, people to people, uh, scientific cooperation, the whole range of state power, then uh, you, you're going to have to step up that right. game. So, Okay. Um, now, in, in your book, you, you talk about instability on the frontier or through all these uh, years. Uh, there are, you give four reasons why you think uh, the depth tank incursion happened and the Death Tank Valley standoff happened. Interestingly, Death Tank is still a major player in terms of uh, the standoff we're seeing in 2020. You don't touch on uh, what happened in Chumar. It was a shorter lived uh, uh, standoff between the two in 2014. Then there is the Doklam standoff. Uh, and now there is uh, uh, the Ladakh standoff that has continued actually from April all the way till December at least. Uh, right now, and we have uh, External Affairs Minister Jai Shankar saying in an interview to the Hindu that, uh, you know, look at Sundaram Chu. He talks about 1988 and says that took nine years nearly to, um, uh, to resolve, and this could uh, easily take as long. But what is interesting is that he continues to say that we still don't know why China did this. So what's your best of why uh, we saw Chinese troops move in in April as they did, why we saw the violent clashes at the Pangong Lake in May and then Galwan in June. What's your, what is your assessment of why do you think it happened? Mm -hmm. So the, the couple of uh, uh, for what we can see from Chinese debates that are now slowly coming out to Indian audiences is you're seeing two or three reasons that are being put across. Uh, one is a geopolitical reason where they have come to believe that uh, India and China are going to be at sort of the opposite ends of this next phase of competition in Asia. And uh, rather than sort of playing it according to that old India policy, they're saying that now we're going to go out and seek our core interests wherever they are. And, and we're going to sort of send a message even to the United States. There's an argument out there which should not be dismissed that this crisis was really a message to other powers out there that we can do this on the India-China frontier and is there anything you can do about it? That's one message. The other was, uh, for them, the Eastern Ladakh, Excitation frontier, right from the 50s, has enormous strategic significance. And so it's actually quite interesting uh, if you look at some of the data that's coming out from Indian agencies, Indian military, that not, not officially, but it reveals it out in media reports, the level of transgressions that you're seeing across the India-China border. Almost the overwhelming majority are happening uh, on the Western sector. So, which is quite interesting because the Western sector, particularly the, the areas around Aksai Chin, have always been very strategic to the Chinese side. While we're seeing relatively tranquility on, uh, on in the Arunachal Tabang area, apart from the Sikkim crisis, which was in Bhutan really, it's more or less not seen that level of competition. So, plus the lines there are more or less frozen. 
there's less ambiguity there. So, so, you, so you're actually seeing the Chinese focusing quite clearly on what they feel are their vital interests on this entire frontier. Uh, that's one, but it's also this bigger uh, policy that they feel that uh, they do not believe there is a possibility of India ever now moving closer to them. Uh, that's the argument that some Chinese scholars are putting out. I mean, some are arguing that now be prepared for a prolonged period of competition with India. So, so I think when we are saying, I, I'm, I'm still not clear on what is Indian official sort of interpretations because it's focusing more on the local military side. I think I would look at the bigger picture that if China's South Asia policy and India policy and Asia policy has taken certain longer range goals, uh, that, that could be quite interesting because then no matter what you do diplomatically, you're dealing with a China that is now taken a particular decision that we are going to uh, uh, be prepared for a period of competition with India. That could be uh, one of the reasons because otherwise there's no other reason to precipitate such a major uh, international crisis with such a large mobilization of forces when your goal is still to sort of win over India from the other side. I think they believe that India has chosen a side in, in, in the future sort of geopolitical competition. So there's no point trying to win it over. Go out and seek your interests. That's, that's what uh, the impression we are getting. That in a sense, India's uh, decision to put its eggs in the American basket is now uh, a given. But what about the other uh, third party, if you like, to this, and, and that is Pakistan? How much was uh, the decision or the timing, if you like, uh, triggered, as some have suggested, by the idea that India began its reorganization of Jammu and Kashmir, that uh, the Home Minister made the statement he did about taking back Aksai Chin last year as a kind mm -hmm. of uh, trigger for the timing of what China did? So, so look at it this way, like, yes, that, that decision really sort of lays out that, uh, uh, that the, the frontier in Aksai Chin now has been accommodated from the Indian map into this new territory of Ladakh. But there are different ways to deal with it, right? I mean, you have statements where the foreign minister and others have then eventually clarified that we, there is no real change in the Indian claims. So, so I don't see that as the, it's more that uh, they are now dealing with those same problems in a different fashion. And what triggered them to do that? Uh, uh, some arguments have also been made that they are beginning to see India anyway pulling out of the India-China economic relationship, which I think preceded this standoff in some ways. So I think there was a broader decision that they possibly saw, like it says, the geopolitical fissure sort of have opened out. You have this power shift and they are not willing to sort of risk the possibility that these portions of these gray zones might just, you, you may not be able to make these changes in the future. Let's put it that way, that they have the power to do it today. In 10 years, they may not. And why lose the opportunity to do it? Because the risk of a downside of losing India is anyway gone. You know, so that's their calculus. All right. I do want to ask, you know, since, uh, as you're pointing out, uh, it seems as if China has decided where India actually stands, despite everything that the Indian government has said, which is that we are, we have never been part of an alliance. We will never be part of an alliance. Uh, continue to look for diplomacy as a, as a way out. How much of this is inevitable in the sense uh, there are those that feel that India must now stand up with like-minded countries, whether that's Australia, whether that's Japan, this concert of democracies, if you like, um, with the United States, simply because uh, that is the preeminent democratic power. Um, and, and whereas India and China, they are Asian countries, they have historic civilizations, uh, but at the end of the day, Today's uh, policy in, in, in India and today's policy in China really don't have that much in common. So how much of the clash between them, uh, the competition between them is really inevitable? So this idea of uh, an ideological sort of competition, if you look back at the 50s, I mean, you had a China which was far more ideological, far more radical, the Mao's China that comes in. And you have, of course, a liberal democratic India led by uh, Nehru in the early 50s. And you see both sides, or certainly the Indian side, reaching out, not buying into the binary of the free world versus the repressed world. The, uh, the, the, the image out there in the Indian foreign policy was that you have a Cold War, which is a geopolitical competition between the United States and the Soviets. And then you have this middle world, the post-colonial world, the non-aligned world, that 
simply is not going to just buy into those binaries to benefit one or the other superpower. So we we kind of sort of moved on from that to now uh, since you want to develop ties with some of the democracies. Uh, I don't think the reason is that you're developing ties because they're democracies. They just so happen that those are China's neighbors and those are the powers, United States, Japan, Korea, who are yeah. feeling a sense of uh, uh, unease at China's rise and they just happen to be your potential future partner. Because let's not forget, your relationship with uh, Russia as well is continued to grow quite strongly during the Modi years despite everything else. So, and they also have, despite their cooperation with the Chinese, a long range uh, uh, sort of a, a geopolitical anxiety that a rising China might displace them in Eurasia as well. So, so I don't see the democracy argument really as the real driver, but because India finds it convenient to sort of uh, use that as a label, then why not? Because, but I think it's a, it's a little bit tricky because, because uh, let's say Europe, for example, really does believe in proselytizing and sharing on, and, dis, and sort of diffusing liberal ideas in the international arena. The United States claims to do so, even though it, the fashion that it does so can sometimes lead to more problems. I don't think India has ever really been that kind of a proselytizing power. So you look at from Modi statements to from Nehru, you always had a more inclusive, universal vision of world order, right? Which irrespective of the types of regimes, yeah, uh, you ultimately have space for all, provided they fulfill or adhere to certain sort of norms. We call it the UN-centric norms of sovereignty, uh, the Westphalian system, or etc. But I don't think uh, uh, dividing up Asia through using democracy is really going to produce a stable security architecture. Because none of these right. powers, at the end of the day, will ultimately agree when the crisis comes, right? So will Japan risk a conflict with China because of Ladakh? I don't think so. Would we risk a conflict with China because uh, of a problem in uh, the Senkaku or the China Sea? So, so it's, it's, I mean, it was hard enough dealing with a, a, uh, the NATO during the Cold War where you had a single European threat to deal with. Here you are dealing with a China that presents um, so many different challenges across its entire periphery from, from uh, Afghanistan, Central Asia, all the way up to the Korean Peninsula. And, there's simply no way to create a pan uh, sort of anti-Chinese united front where you can coordinate in an Article 5 NATO style strategy. So if you can't do that, then you're ultimately going to be left uh, uh, alone during a major crisis. And you've seen that in Ladakh. I don't think anybody has uh, been able to step up and they know they can't because the geographic and the geostrategic setting in the Himalayan frontiers, unless you literally invite 100,000 American troops into India, which is not possible, and neither, why would they risk that? Because they, they have major forces in East Asia that will be held hostage to a counter retaliation well, by the Chinese. So, plus they are in the middle of a massive pullout from South Asia at present. From exactly. Afghanistan. exactly. So, so I don't think anybody is really interested in pulling uh, our chestnuts out of the fire. So which is again comes back to that entire argument that I'm trying to make in this book that for various reasons, you just going to have to find a new sort of arrangement. It may not be a new modus vivendi, but the idea that you can compete and cooperate with China. And this was something that, by the way, we bought into it for quite a while. It's, it was only abandoned recently. Uh, it's not been abandoned, by the way. I think the official Indian policy is still uh, buys into a more complex China policy. But the discourse that is surrounding it in the public sphere, in the think tanks, and, and generally in the, in, the, in, 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 in the thinking minds outside the government, is the belief that maybe the, now the time has come to make a hard call and make that big tipping point. And I, I feel we still need to be circumspect because it would be premature to sort of uh, make that clarion call that we are now ready for major power competition, which we're not. So it, it would be actually a disservice to our own rights. All right, and just to sum it up, I know that you refer to in your book of the idea of Narendra Modi and Nehru's ghost, because this is something that hangs over every prime minister. Uh, the idea of how you will deal with China is, uh, you know, the, in a sense, the, the battle with Pakistan has been fought and won enough times for it to be very, very conclusive. Uh, but with China, there is always uh, the worry, how much do you think Nehru's ghost really plays a factor in today's policy? So I think in the, the real lesson of Nehru's China policy was you do not want to get into a major conflict with China. I think that conflict in 62, as I show in the book, 
was something that was a grave miscalculation on our part. Yes, the Chinese overreacted. There was a planned uh, decision to, to strike in October 1962, but we simply took our eyes off the ball. There was so many episodes or, or phases where you could have sort of avoided conflict. You could have reached a settlement or at least an interim arrangement. So I think that's the lesson for policymakers today. And I think uh, for Narendra Modi, the idea that to not end up like what Nehru did after this prolonged period of engagement in a massive clash that ended his foreign policy in a sense, I think that would be something that is quite conscious in the minds of our leaders today. They do not want a repeat of 62, partly which is why they are strengthening themselves, but also they are not going to provoke a confrontation with China if it can be avoided. So I think that's the change or the lesson from the past. And certainly don't tie yourself into a position um, from which it Where you can't exit from a crisis. Absolutely. Absolutely. Good point. Uh, Zarama Gorasin, I'd like to thank you. Uh, this has been a fun chat. The book, if you're watching, is Power Shift. It's available online at Amazon, in the stores as well. I do hope you enjoyed the read. Thanks again. Thank you so much, Vasni. Thank you all.